may be wrong, but I think I saw something white out there. What? Yes, it's a white flag. Hey, Sarge, they're showing a white flag. Yeah, well, we told them we'd make a deal with them. Perhaps that's what they want. I'll go out and see what they want. If there's any translating to be done, they can do it themselves. Well, watch yourself. You can never tell with these blinders. Don't trust them, Joe. It's a trick. I'll be all right, Jimmy. You just stay there and keep me covered. You gotta get out of here and quick. Sergeant Gunn, United States Army Tank Detachment. Yeah, we're surrounded, and the only way out is south. So how far do you reckon you're going to get in that tin can? She's a good tank. And right now, she's the only ticket you got out of here. Sergeant, wait a minute, Sergeant. We're coming with you. Jimmy, find her up. You got anything in that radio yet? Nothing but static and Heil Hitler. All we need is water. I told you to measure that water in a cup. Sergeant, that's a British Sudanese with an Italian prisoner. Can you guide us to the nearest well? I think I can. We've got to take them with us. We can't leave them here to die. Stop! Hey, lads, we got company! What are you smiling at? Got a drop lid. Spread out and look for that well. Send down the bucket, there's still a little water dripping. Three swallows for each of us. Gentlemen, off track, coming this way. Well, she's gone dry. 500 thirsty Germans on their way here, desperate for water. Suppose we hold them up for two or three days while they're trying to get it. Shit. Maybe nobody will ever know what happened here. Surrender your arms, and you can go free. I'll make you an offer. Water for guns. There is no water here. We'll make no further attempt to take the well. If we get enough water, this is my last offer. Reckon we've got a chance of winning. It's a hundred to one shot. It's 1943, and World War II is on. It's a time to rally all Americans. The United States is no longer a peacetime nation. It's time to pull together, and everyone must do their part. As President Roosevelt said at the time, the movie theater is a necessary and beneficial part of the war effort. Hollywood studios would shift their focus towards films that would help rally Americans to get behind the war effort, to go out and buy war bonds, to boost morale and convince them to do anything they can to support our soldiers and to win this deadly conflict. Many of the movies made during World War II were meant to be patriotic rallying cries that reaffirmed a sense of national purpose. They would emphasize patriotism, group efforts, and reinforce the value of individual sacrifice for the greater good. They would also stamp our enemies as being flat out evil, painting them in broad and racist stereotypes. Today, some of the portrayals that were done of the enemy are offensive to see. But at the time, it wasn't given a second thought. There was no qualms of how fairly they were portrayed. The important message to get across then was to make it clear it was vital we defeat these inhuman monsters at any cost. Sahara, not that flick, came out in 1943 and was one of the dozens of wartime pictures that dramatized the war during the period. It would send a message of the sacrifices that must be made and what needed to be done to win and get our boys home. It would also become a movie that audiences flocked to. Sahara would become Columbia Pictures' biggest moneymaker in 1943. It's also a Humphrey Bogart movie that I think gets somewhat overlooked, or at least not talked about enough. In comparison to some of his more famous films and performances with 
all those great bogey lines everyone loves to quote, Sahara gets lost in the shuffle. But I think it's a great movie. We're in Africa, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and meet Sergeant Joe Gunn. There's a real meat and potatoes American soldier name for you. Him and his two pals, Jimmy and Waco, have become cut off from their unit when a general retreat is ordered. Traversing the dry Sahara Desert in their beloved tank, Lulabel, they set out to rejoin Allied forces. Lulabel, by the way, is the only female in the movie. Gunn's affection for his metal baby is the extent of any romance we're going to see. They come across a bombed-out field hospital and pick up a collection of stragglers. They're basically a representation of the Allies. Down the road, a Sudanese sergeant with an Italian prisoner joins them. Gunn assumes command of this group and at the top of their list is finding some water. The Sudanese sergeant knows the desert and guides them to a well. Before getting there, a Luftwaffe pilot attacks them. He gets shot down and they bring this Nazi prisoner along as well. Making it to the well, they find it's practically dried out with only a little water trickling out. It's enough to quench their thirst before some German scouts arrive. A firefight commences. The group learns a German battalion in desperate need of water is on its way to the well. Now this small group could make a break for the British lines, but Gunn decides to make a stand at the well in order to delay the Germans, figuring it will give our allies time to reinforce. The group keeps up the charade that the well has plenty of water to keep the Germans fighting there. They make the offer to trade water for guns. The Germans don't like that and are determined they can easily squash this small band of allies. Which side will manage to hold out longer? The vastly outnumbered ragtag group or the thirsty weak Germans? This is a terrific movie. The story had been done before. The premise was used in The Lost Patrol, the Soviet film The Thirteen, You get wrapped up in this conflict and the desperate situation these characters are cornered into. It's like a western standoff between cowboys and Indians. The story actually would be adapted later into the full-fledged western, The Last of the Comanches. Only if you talk. Wie stark ist der Company? Welche Ausrüstung? Was sind die Pläne? Ask him again. Keep asking him. We gotta break him. Come on, talk! Wie stark ist der Company? Bogart is great here. He's the tough, brave leader hero, staring down the enemy, playing his bluff, and is completely prepared to see this through, no matter what the outcome is going to be. But we also see he's humane. He cares for the men. When their numbers inevitably start to dwindle and men are lost, it guts them. Bogie played some interesting complex characters throughout his career. When he stepped into leading men roles, he started to specialize in characters that were never just black and white, but shades of gray. There's more to them than just a hard-boiled cynical exterior. They could be romantic and sensitive, have empathy, be filled with paranoia. He humanized these tough guy roles, and he was able to pull it off so flawlessly. It's no wonder Bogart became a Hollywood icon. Bogie's two pals are played by Bruce Bennett, who would later work with Bogie again in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and one of my favorites, Dan Duryea. I love this guy. If I were casting my ultimate movie, I would definitely find a spot for Dan. Duryea was best known for playing despicable sinister heels in the world of film noir. He's so enjoyable to watch when he's let loose in those parts. Here, he's not as colorful and simply plays Bogie's army buddy. But still, it's nice to see him. There is a lot of propaganda sprinkled throughout this movie. But it manages to not be as obtrusive as many of the war pictures were at the time. I mean, it's not hard to miss Bogey's pep talk. Well, nobody minds giving his life, but this is throwing it away. Why? Why? Why did your people go about their business in London when the Germans were throwing everything in the book at them? Why did your little boats take the men off the beach at Dunkirk? Why did the Russians make a stand at Moscow? Why did the Chinese move whole cities thousands of miles inland and the Japs attacked him? It's as if he's speaking to the audience. With his inspiring speech, the the men all agree this is a fight worth taking on. Bogey might as well be standing in front of a giant flag like George C. Scott. The whole idea of the soldiers agreeing to an almost guaranteed doom situation, they all know this is practically suicide. 
is a clear message to audiences of the sacrifices that have to be made. I mean, these guys have a choice. It would have been much different had they been trapped or if they were ordered to stay or that they didn't have any alternatives of what to do. Nope. They willingly choose to stick this out believing this practically certain hopeless act will make a difference in the bigger picture of victory. There is some heavy-handed dialogue. The Allies all working together, learning about one another, respecting each other. We hear about their families, their dreams, their fears, how they just want to go home. Yeah, there's, there's Hollywood cliches going on. But it does work. You start to care for these characters, so when they are killed, it's not just throwaway characters that make quick exits. Each of the deaths ratchet up the stakes more and more for the remaining survivors, too. One of the young soldiers, by the way, is Lloyd Bridges. J. Carroll Nash is the distraught Italian soldier, who might be the Allies' enemy in this war, but you sympathize for him. As we learn, he's fighting not because he believes in the Axis, but his country is forcing him to fight and he just wants to get home to see his wife and little Bambino. He scored an Oscar nomination for his performance. Meanwhile, there's no such complexity to the captured Nazi pilot, and he becomes another headache the guys have to deal with. He's treacherous, scheming, and is even ready to stab his ally in the back. This is a Nazi. Maybe you find out. It's like a mad dog. Maybe. He's won a lot of prizes. There's not a trace of compassion from any of them. You really see an example of the comparison between the Americans and Germans in how they value others' lives. When Bogey's tank first meets the Italian prisoner, Bogey decides there's not enough room for him and forces him off where he has to take his chances of surviving alone in the desert. Basically a death sentence. But Bogey can't do it. He stops the tank and brings the poor guy along. Just because he's their enemy, he can't bring himself to just let the man die if he's able to help him. His conscience just couldn't take it. Then we have the German officer. This guy is just flat out mean. When learning of the failure of one of his soldiers, he just shoots him. He has been executed. He ignores the honorable act of not shooting at a soldier while a peaceful white flag of truce is raised. Who are you going to root for in this movie? These guys or Bogart? Come on. Setting aside the propaganda message that it's sending out and some of the war movie cliches that it contains. You see, those men out there have never known the the dignity of freedom. It's still a very compelling story filled with some great performances. It's not a movie that focuses on the horrors of war. It's more of an adventure film, which is what Americans wanted to see at the time. They'd go out to the movies, watch some newsreels, witness an adventure, see the camaraderie between the men, be reminded we're in the midst of a conflict and need to work together for a noble cause, be prepared to make sacrifices for the greater good, and then walking out inspired by seeing a success battling near impossible odds. Sahara is also kind of a unique war movie in the sense that not many war movies were set during the North African campaign. So based on its setting, that sandy hot terrain men are fighting on, the battling of harsh conditions on top of fighting against an enemy, makes Sahara stand out. It's kind of funny how the men trying to get a mouthful of water plays as tense a situation as them facing down a German battalion. From all the war films that were made during this period, Sahara is one of the best. In fact, Sahara is one of my favorite war movies, period. Fast forward more than 50 years to 1995, we get a remake of Sahara, a made-for-cable movie for Showtime and directed by Brian Treacherd Smith. It coincided with the 50th anniversary of the end of the war. I've read this remake was shot in only 18 days. Same story, we're in North Africa, the Sahara Desert, 1942. Sergeant Joe Gunn, now played by Jim Belushi, is making a retreat in his tank Lulabelle with his two comrades as Rommel's forces advance. Gunn meets a bunch of allied stragglers. They hop on the tank, they need water, they capture a Luftwaffe pilot. 
ba 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 it is the same exact story. It's not just the story that gets retold here, but some of the same exact scenes are redone. It's the same conflicts, the same situations. We have the same characters. Some of the dialogue is done word for word as it was in the original. This remake of Sahara has got to be one of the most copy and pasted remakes ever. The remake of The Omen, you know how it was a beat-for-beat remake of the original? It didn't offer anything new to the story or try anything different with it? That's what Sahara does. Everyone talks about the shot-for-shot remake of Psycho. This Sahara practically rivals it for attempting to make an exact paint-by-numbers reproduction of an older film. Only now it's in color. But despite it being a carbon copy of the original film, doing nothing new with this story and it following it right down the line like following a recipe, it's actually... Yeah, it's pretty good. I have to admit, when I first watched this, I was very skeptical. I went in with the jaded attitude, okay, let's see how they do with this. But when it finished, I thought, yeah, that wasn't bad at all. The story works. All the actors, while they may not be as memorable as the ones in the original, all do a decent job with their parts. The action scenes, not surprisingly, play as more intense, bloody, and violent than they had in 1943. It also manages to downplay the patriotic message that permeated in the original. There isn't that rallying cry that runs through the story this time. Belushi, who I still think of as John's younger brother, I still haven't gotten over his death. I'm not a big Jim Belushi fan, and I wouldn't have chosen him to play the Bogart role. It took me a while to get used to him, but he ends up being pretty decent in this. But when we run out of water and they're dying of thirst, you think they're going to thank me for bringing an extra mouth along? Huh? This is about survival. I thought that's why you put me in charge, Captain. I think he looks a bit too portly to play an army sergeant stranded in the desert, though. The other most notable actor out of the cast is Michael Matisse, who plays Frenchie, the angry Frenchman who despises the Germans and who just wants to kill as many of them as he can. His character is given much more of an edge than the original Frenchie. There are no traces of happiness in this guy, and he is just filled with hate. It's actually his uncontrollable hate that dooms him. That's another change this movie makes that's kind of interesting. Whereas in the original, Frenchie has a final confrontation with the Germans and becomes the victim of the treacherous officer who ignores a momentary truce and shoots him in the back. Here... This Frenchie is the one who instigates things. It's his own uncontrollable anger that does him in. And he seems quite satisfied with what he's done, even if it results in his death. There are a few changes that this remake does that actually work pretty well. It completely drops Waco's run for help. Before the Germans arrive, Waco leaves in the hopes he can get reinforcements. This becomes a bit of a lifeline for the guys. There's some hope help will arrive. Yet, this never really amps up the tension as much as I think it's meant to. We see Bennett running around in the desert, but it just kind of feels background to what's going on at the well. Here, this is completely dropped. Waco stays at the well with all the rest of the men. There's no chance of contacting any help. They're on their own. They knew when remaking this, they had to downplay the propaganda messages that run through the original. It's different times, and they do it pretty well. Bogey's big speech where he rallies the men is really cut down by Belushi. He doesn't give a laundry list of battles that have been fought. The Nazi pilot, while he still does all the nasty things as he had in the original, isn't quite as evil. They have shots of him looking reflective at some of the Allies. You kind of wonder what he's thinking. Does he have some sympathy? Does he have regrets? Is he just being arrogant? Not sure. He tells Frenchie he doesn't represent what he hates about the Nazis. That he might be the enemy, but he's not the monster that's fueling the rage in Frenchie. I do my duty. I fight with honor. I'm not one of those who kill your villagers. Open your mouth again, and I gut you like a fish. 
I have to say, I was quite surprised at how well this was updated. Some things, though... Eh, this remake keeps a lot of the original scenes and dialogue. And while it might have played okay coming from a movie in 1943, the attempts of updating it don't play as successful. The point of some of the original scenes were they were designed to increase support for the war effort and send a message. With that gone in this presentation, playing out some of the same scenes come off kind of awkward and hammy, even with some of the changes made to them. Like there's the scene of Waco in Tambul. They're talking together in the bottom of the well. The whole interaction is sending out the message of different countries and races working together. Okay. The scene even ends with that declaration. I mean, you can't miss it. You sure learn things in the army. Yes, we both have much to learn from each other. Yeah. In the remake, they redo the same scene. It's the same conversation about how many wives Tambul has, and of course they eliminate the point of why that scene was originally done. That's understandable. You don't need to draw a line under it. But without that, the whole scene feels rather quaint and out of place. It's weird. For the most part, the story and the scenes all still work and serve their function. We're given a chance to spend time with each of the men and learn about them. But had this been a completely original war film made in 1995, I don't think they would have written the men's interactions the same way as they had been in 1943. So redoing them, even kind of loosely with some added tweaks and restaging, they come off as a bit odd to me. Maybe it's just me and they wouldn't be so awkward for someone who never saw the original. It could be the shadow of Bogey's film is hanging over me and clouding my perception of this. Of course, the most obvious difference here is the movie is in color. It was filmed in Australia and it does look nice. The desert looks hot barren, the set of the well is changed up, then you got the hardware and Lulabelle. It all looks cool. Of course, the action scenes are much more hardcore and violent, and some of the battle scenes are really well put together and impressive. Some of the shots of the Germans racing across the desert are some memorable images. I don't have a lot of bad to say about this flick. There's always the question that arises when a remake comes out, why bother remaking this movie? valid question. And I don't know what the point of this was. Maybe it was just for Showtime to have a movie come out to mark the anniversary of the war. I don't know. I don't think it's a better movie as the original Sahara. It's the same story that had been done before. Actually, a couple times. But it is effective and ends up being a pretty good retelling of the story. I don't know how available this movie is. If someone was completely unfamiliar with the original and had the chance to watch this, I'd recommend it. The original would be the preference, but this remake does an admirable job and ends up being a pretty good flick on its own. I would say it's one of the better remakes that have been done. I don't know if it gets any attention, or even if anyone knows about it, but I would mark it as a success. Still, it's not as good as Bogey and his Lula Belt, but I'd classify it as a very good remake. There's not many of those out there. Well done. You have come a long way, Sergeant, to pull British chestnuts out of fire. No, we don't mind. We like chestnuts. Don't want to see them burn. <laughs>